All right, my dears, let's talk the solo show. <clears throat> so my solo show is having its Chicago premiere next month. And I've been getting a ton of questions from folks about how did you write a solo show and how did you get it produced? And so I decided to give you this secret formula as it were, and it's actually not rocket science. Um, the reason to write a solo show, one, you're an actor who can do a whole lot more than the roles that they're going out for. Solo show is the primary vehicle for that kind of person because a solo show gives you the opportunity to let the world know I can do 10 things differently. I can play 20 different people and you're not even considering me for those other roles. You're just considering me for what you, what I look like right now. So in terms of getting casting and directors, people in the industry to see you differently as an artist and for you to go out more, creating a solo show is the ideal solution to that problem. Secondly, I wrote a solo show because I really wanted to learn how to write. I knew, I always knew I wanted to act certain stories and be a part of certain stories that were being told. So that's why I wanted to write a solo show. And the process of writing a solo show taught me how to write. It taught me how to write screenplays. It taught me how to write um, well-made traditional plays, multi-character plays, period plays, language plays. It taught me how to write quick, fast, and dirty and on the job. Um, mostly because writing takes a while because you have to generate lots of material. And then once you have a piece, you're going to go into workshops and labs to fine tune it, to play it in front of audiences to see what works. So by the end of that process, you're gonna know how to write. And once you know how to write, that's something that nobody can ever take away from you. It is a gift. Like my mother used to say, you're gonna take a typing class because as long as you can type, you're always gonna have a job. She was right, <laughs> right? You know, once you know how to write, you're always gonna have a job as an artist. You can write grants, you can write plays for yourself to be in, you can write screenplays, you you know, it gives you a kind of power. And then the third reason is passive income, right? Meaning when you have a solo show, I my solo show premiered at New York Theater Workshop in 2008. It's still touring and showing up in places. I'm not always performing it. So sometimes theaters or non-traditional venues like folks, um, uh, hire me to do Black History Month excerpts from the show or a spoken word festival, which is what I was invited to last year to do my show for a week. You know, different kinds of venues, museums and schools want to do your solo show. Sometimes you're going with them, but a lot of times they're just what's called licensing the play. Meaning somebody wants to do my play, they call my agent and my agent says, sure, we will could put together a contract. They're gonna pay me a fee for using my words and putting on a production of my play. And then as the writer, I get a percentage of the box office. So that means a lot of the times where I'm not even performing, I'm making money while I'm sleeping. And that is better than residuals <laughs> because you control that. You made the work, it's yours forever. So, the idea of writing a solo show is a very, very smart one. I knew I wanted to move from just doing regional theater to much more film and television. So I used my solo show, that vehicle, as an opportunity to get people from the industry in the audience to see my work. And tons of casting folks, you know, if you check out my Facebook page about Liberty City or even go to the Liberty City website, libertycityplay.com, tons of feedback from industry folks. I got a manager that I had been chasing for five years. <laughs> I had invited her to every show, every movie opening. She would not sign me. And finally, she came to see my show and she went, oh my God, I had no idea you could do that. And I was like, there's something to this solo show business. Hello. <laughs> I knew I could do those characters, but the industry didn't. So nobody was considering me for roles. Nobody was considering me for things that were much older. Nobody was reimagining me playing certain roles that have been written for a man. Maybe I could play it because I understood the temperament and gender didn't matter. It opened up this entire new world and it got me a very powerful Los Angeles manager. Um, so, so that I don't have to fight to go in for TV auditions anymore or independent film, which when I signed with my new manager, you know, that my whole TV and film career took off. 
you know, I booked independent movies back to back. That had never happened. And that was because we sat down and we had a strategy, you know, she was going to, she was going to start sending me out for things emotionally that the characters she'd seen in my solo show were doing. That's how she was selling me to people. And that's how I got tons of auditions that were not necessarily written for a little black lady, <laughs> you know? So it's, if you use the solo show form to make your career jump to the next level, that's a totally viable reason. To, you, to say, I'm going to write a solo show. The other viable reason is I got a story in me that needs to be told, right? And with the solo show, you ain't got to wait for nobody. You can just write it, <laughs> you know, and then start reading it everywhere. You know, you can, you can read excerpts for stand-up. And I tell my clients this, who've coached with me uh, on getting their solo shows up on their feet, and you should be reading sections of it. Go to an open mic. Go to a poetry reading read sections of your solo show so you can see how people respond because the solo show is actually just you standing there telling a story to somebody sitting in the audience, you know, and waiting for their reaction. You're really talking to them. It's direct address to your audience. It's terrifying. It's exhilarating. It's a great deal of fun. And most importantly, as an artist, you have control. You get to say, no, I don't want to do that venue this week. Or no, I don't want to do 20 shows in one week. I only want to do four. You know, because I'm going over here to write something else or I'm going over here to be in a movie or I'm going over here. It gives you power. And of course, that's the big reason I teach because I'm like, artists give away their power too much. So the solo show format, there's one more thing the solo show does. The solo show doing it is like, it's like the Olympics of acting. <laughs> if you can survive a run of a solo show, Every role you do after that is easy. It's just easy. It works out your actor muscles. This listening and responding, that's absolutely critical in a solo show. You really have to be talking to someone all the time. You know, memorizing lines, that no longer is a problem because all the lines are yours. <laughs> and eight show weeks in a solo show are fantastic, exhilarating, horrifying, and the best thing ever. Mostly because you are driving each scene or each story, right? In a traditional play, the person is standing there, you have an acting object, your acting partner, you're talking to them in the scene, they're giving you something back. In the solo show, you are both of those people. You are driving the action, going after something. You're also the person receiving that person going after the action and then pushing back. You're doing it all. If you can do a solo show after that, somebody be like, oh, do you want to come over here and do a Shakespearean play? You're like, whatever, I just finished a solo show. Bring it. It's kind of magical. Um, and I wasn't aware of this when I first started writing. So I decided to put together a series of videos about how you write a solo show, how you figure out what you're going to write, how you generate that material, how you learn how to edit it. And most importantly, which lots of people don't talk about, how to get it produced. And I got my first show produced by having a reading at a theater. I just called the theater and I said, I know I've been doing readings there for forever. I'd like to do a reading of my solo show. Would you guys be into coming? And they said, yes. And I did the reading. And then afterwards, the artistic director walked up to me and said, we'd like to do your show. And we have a slot this season. Well, you could have knocked me over with a brick, <laughs> but there it was, right? So there are a lot of factors that happened in there. I worked for a theater. When you have relationships, you're an actor. You've been doing readings everywhere, right? You have relationships with all those places where you've been doing readings. You've been working for free. So when you finally write your solo show and you say, hey, will you give me some space to read this and give me your feedback? People are glad to see you because you've been working for them for free for a very long time. So the secret of how you get produced, it's not that much of a secret, you know? And I actually have to say, I got notes and texts from people who are like, how did you get them to do your solo show? And I was like, dude, I've been working for free. Six, seven years out here, you know, doing theater for free. The least they could do is give me a reading. And of course, I did not show them my solo show until it was done, which is another deal that people don't tell you when you are shopping a script. You do not shop a script with a draft, hoping that somebody will produce you. You present 
the script production ready, which means you've had secret readings, you've read sections at poetry slams, you've done it in little community theaters. This show has been done before anybody in the off-Broadway, Broadway world ever sees it. Very smart. So let's talk about the format of solo shows. Solo shows, I will have to say that I saw Whoopi Goldberg's first show on Broadway. You know, the one with the little girl who had the t-shirt on her head and that was her hair and the surfer girl um, and the, the ex-drug addict who went to Germany and visited Anne Frank's house. Like that show was just called Whoopi. Was, was like the North Star for me. <laughs> I was in grad school and I got the video and I watched it and I went, oh, I see me. I had never seen me. I had never seen my vision of who I could be as an artist. You know, you sit in the agent's office and they're like, who are you like, who are you like? And they were like, are you like Angela Bassett? I was like, you're just saying that because Angela Bassett is the only person right now getting any attention as a black actress, I'm not. And it was a conundrum, you know, if you don't see the thing that you want to be, if you have no role models, you have a hard time imagining it and putting it to the pieces together. And for me, that's what was at stake. I was like, well, I, do I want to write a solo show? Nobody's going to pay attention. And then I watched Whoopi's solo show on Broadway. And I knew I could do that. Now, I had no idea how to write. <laughs> I was like, I put pen to a piece of paper and I was still shaking and sweating. I didn't know how to write. I, had no, I didn't even know where to begin with that. But what was important was that I started looking for models for myself of what of the kind of artist I wanted to be. And I started paying attention to the work of people like that. I started watching solo shows, but I also started watching actors who I really liked who transformed. And not everybody transforms. Lots of actors play themselves. And at the time that I was in grad school, Kate Blanchett was just on the scene doing Elizabeth. And I was watching her career and her showing up as a completely different human being in every single role. And I was like, hmm, there's something to that. I think that's the thing I want to do. And so I started watching. I started watching Gesture. I started watching how on the dime she would change characters. You know, I started watching interviews of her. I watched Whoopi and I analyzed that show. I was like, okay, so she had five or six monologues and each monologue is its own story. Okay. Maybe I should start with monologues. Now that's one form of the solo show. And before you decide to write a solo show, I'm going to recommend to you that you start watching some great solo work, All right? And solo work gets a bad name because sometimes people just do solo work so their career can move ahead and they don't care about good writing. And then we're all stuck with somebody just doing stand up because the writing's no good, right? If the writing's no good, it's not going to help your career but it's also not gonna get you produced for the next 10 years because theaters love good writing. Even if it's a solo show, they love good writing. And some theaters have a total rule, like we don't do solo shows. And that's because the assumption is that solo shows are somebody standing up there doing stand up or complaining about how much they hate their parents or somebody working out therapy. So I say this to you, begin to watch solo shows and if you decide that you want to do a solo show to work out your acting chops, but you're not interested in learning how to write, then you need to pay somebody to write it for you, right? Or you write it with them so that you make sure you have a really good solid writer. And that's super important because like I said at the beginning, this solo show is going to make you money for the next 10, 15, 20 years because it's going to continually be done, right? It's only going to continually be done if the writing is good. Meaning if the writing is good, anybody could stand up and do it, right? If you're the only person that can do your solo show, it's because the solo show is writing on the merits of your personality and what you know about the world. It's not on the page. And if you're going to write a solo show that is going to make you some serious money, the story has to structurally be on the page. So our first step, and I'm going to give you some recommendations of two, two different types of solo shows. Uh, Whoopi's first solo show, I think the, v the video was only available on video, like at Blockbuster or Kim's video. You should watch it and you should watch it right away. And you should really look at each monologue. Each monologue has a beginning, middle and end. The character, we know exactly who that character is in the first two sentences of 
every single monologue. You're not guessing the age, the race, the economic background, the point of view, all of that in the first three sentences. That's critical to a solo show. We absolutely have to know who you are, why you're here, and what your problem is in the first three minutes of you talking, right? The first minute you make a gesture and announce that you are somebody else, we actually need to know who you are in that moment. Little kid, right? A dude. Like the gesture is incredibly important because you're switching characters on the dime, right? So whatever your solo show is, if it's not the monologue form, know that that ability to switch character and the specificity of the writing, which allows your audience to enter into the experience because they know who's talking. <laughs> and that has to be in the writing. If it's not in the writing, then you're an actor if they're struggling to make bad writing work. That's not gonna make you any money and it's not gonna help your career. So if you wanna learn how to write, and that's part of your process, for part of your goals for doing a solo show, then make that a goal and get in some classes or get a coach or team up with a writer who is produced and has a great reputation. In the long run, that will help you get your show produced if you partner with a writer that has a really strong reputation. My co-writer for my solo show was Jessica Blank. At the time that we partnered, she had a hit off-Broadway play that was running for a year and a half, The Exonerated, that got turned into a movie. I was like, well, I love her writing, one, that's good, but I would be dumb to be trying to write a solo show by myself and I've never written anything when there's a writer right here that I'm working for because I was in her, I was in her play and I was in her movie and she has a reputation which means that's gonna open doors when I call a theater and say, can I do a reading? I wrote a solo show with Jessica Blank, the author of The Exonerated. Duh, that's a strategy for getting produced. So let me go back to the format. So when you're deciding to do a solo show, you're either gonna learn how to write, find somebody to write who already knows how to write with a great reputation, who can help it get produced, or pay somebody to write it, right? You talk to them, you tell them the story, and then they write it. Make sure it's good writing or it's not making you any money. Then I want you to look at solo shows. I want you to look at Whoopi's solo show. Nalaja's son's solo show, No Child, is brilliantly written. And the proof is in the pudding. The fact that anybody can pick up that play and do it, and it's understandable, means it's good writing. The fact that theaters have taken her solo show, No Child, and cast it with four or five different actors and made it a real normal play, not a solo show, means that the writing was super good, right? and it ran for a long time. Um, her work's fantastic. Danny Hawk's work is fantastic. Watch him flip those characters on the dime. Watch him be emotionally invested in each character. As we watch him transform, we're not watching Danny Hawk. We're watching the character. He's telling a story and he's somebody else. That's also a real clue. This is a good solo show. I'm not seeing the actor, I'm seeing these characters. I know them, they're specific. Um, so far I'm talking about, I like Nalasha Sun's work, Heather Raffo's Nine Parts of Desire. Heather is one of my clients and a, a great, great friend of mine is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant writer. And her show too was monologue based. Sarah Jones's shows are monologue based, but each monologue is its own story, right? That's one way to write a solo show. And it's a very traditional way to write a solo show. I have a series of five monologues and they may be unified by, oh, we're all at the same poetry slam, like Sarah Jones's work, or, oh, we all live in the same neighborhood that's being gentrified, like Danny Hawk's work. So there are four or five monologues that are coming out of a common story and why these people are here. This is all the people in the block. These are all the people at the poetry slam. All right, so there's a monologue driven show. And then there are shows that what drives the show is the story. And so it's a story about one family or it's a story about a school, for example, No Child. That is a story about this teacher at a school, right? So her play isn't just a bunch of monologues about different subjects. It's her journey through the school. It's her introducing all the kids that she has to teach and their parents and the other teachers. And then this group of people, this teacher and her students have to get through a challenge, which is to put this play on its feet. So that's not a monologue based show. That's a play. And it should look just like any other play. It just happens to be that the solo artist is standing there being everybody and changing in between the scenes. So I think the first thing to do is to start reading 
solo shows and read them vigorously and read them for ones that you feel that you're related to, right? And after you've read a bunch of them, Nine Parts of Desire, No Child, I love Syringa Tree. I think the structure of it is fantastic. Whoopi Show, um, Danny Hawk, uh, Sarah Jones. Um, look at those shows. And then look at some Richard Pryor. Look at some stand-up comedians who tell story. Look at Chris Rock. Stand-up comedians who really tell a story that's not necessarily about them are doing genius solo work. If it's just somebody standing there complaining and dissing folks, that's stand-up, straight stand-up. But there's a fine line with the kind of stand-up that actually is a solo play because they're telling story. And I love Richard Pryor's early work. It's all on Netflix. Watch how he tells the story and becomes his grandmother and becomes the old man in front of the, the, the store. That's amazing solo work. So that's my assignment to you. And then we're gonna come back in my next video, and we're gonna talk about how to put those pieces together. Okay, thanks.